In this video, I'm going to explain what a lease is. Now, it may be apparent to you what a lease is, but under ASC 842, there's certain parameters you need to look at to determine whether or not a lease agreement falls under that standard in the FASB codification. So let's look at the definition of a lease and then you'll be able to know in the future whether or not this standard, ASC 842, applies to you and your clients. Sometimes you'll have a situation where the entity is going to use a portion of an asset, such as a fiber optic cable. I ran into this a few months ago, and the client was asking, does ASC 842 apply to my situation? And they were going to basically rent a portion of a fiber optic cable. So would 842 always be applicable when there's a lease agreement? Not necessarily. And we're going to see why in the definition of what a lease is. We see in this slide there's really four things that have to be in play in order for 842 to apply to the agreement. We see that one, it has to be an identified asset. Two, it conveys control. Three, for a period of time. And four, in exchange for consideration. So the first thing you have to know is do you have an identified asset? If the agreement says I'm going to use 3% of a building, well, that's not necessarily an identified asset. If the agreement says we're going to use the third floor of that building, then yes, you have an identified asset. The, the agreement also has to convey control to the leasee and for a period of time. So if you have an agreement and it doesn't specify the length of time that the entity has control, then 842 doesn't apply. And then that last criteria, it has to be in exchange for consideration. So there has to be some type of consideration exchange in order for that agreement to fall under 842. Here's the definition of what a lease is, and I'm just going to read it for a second. Bear with me. A lease is a contract or part of a contract that conveys the right to control the use of identified property, plant, or equipment an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. So in this definition, we see those factors we just mentioned. Now, I bring this slide up simply to say it has to be a contract or a part of a contract. So you can have embedded leases. So look at the various agreements your entity has and see whether or not there's a lease agreement. And by the way, it doesn't have to say lease agreement at the top of the document. It's just, is there a contract and does it involve those four factors we talked about a moment ago? If it does, then it falls under 842. If not, then it doesn't. So what does the word control mean? It means two things, or two things have to be in place in order to have control. One, the leasee has, has to have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from the use of the asset. And secondly, that leasee has to have the right to direct the use of the asset. So if they can't control how the asset is used, then that agreement does not fall under 842. If they don't reap the economic benefits of the agreement, then that agreement does not fall under 842.
Now, the second issue is what is an identified asset? Well, it has to be physically distinct. So we said earlier, it has to be, say, a floor of a building. It can't just be a nebulous part of the building. It has to be a specific part of the building. Another example in this slide is a segment of a pipe. So maybe the lease agreement says the entity has a right to the first five miles of this pipe. Then that would be physically distinct. If you are renting, say, a portion of a fiber optic cable, then maybe it's not a maybe it's a, an agreement that doesn't fall under 842 because it's not physically distinct unless the agreement gives that the use of that asset or substantially all of the capacity of the asset to the leasee. If it provides substantially all of the capacity of that asset, such as a fiber optic cable, then that agreement would fall under 842. If you look at an agreement and you determine that it does fall under ASC 842, you may be wondering, well, what impact does that have on the balance sheet and the income statement. So let's take a brief look at what happens when an agreement is really a lease under 842. The first thing we see on the balance sheet is we're going to add a right of use asset. We're also going to add the lease liability. Now this would be true for a financing lease or an operating lease. I'll explain those concepts in another video, so check those out. But this is the initial impact when you set up the lease. You'll debit uh, the right of use asset, which is an intangible asset. You'll also credit the lease liability for the present value of the future payments to be made. So wh what other effects occur on the income statement and say the cash flow statement. Let's take a quick look. In this slide, you'll see in the middle box the impact on the income statement. So if you have a financing lease, you're going to have interest expense and a right of use amortization expense. If you have an operating lease, you're just going to have a lease expense and that amount would be on a straight line basis. Over in the third box, you see the impact on the cash flow statement. There's some differences in how the leases are accounted for based on whether it's a financing lease or an operating lease on that cash flow statement. We see for financing leases, the interest expense, which is, in, which is a cash outflow, that's showing up in the operating section of the cash flow statement. Of course, you're also paying the principal on that lease agreement, and that is a financing activity. This may seem strange to you, but if you do the accounting for the operating leases, we see all of those payments showing up in the operating section. Now, logically, that makes sense. It just may feel strange that you do one thing for the financing leases and another thing for the operating leases. Just remember, if you have a financing lease, uh, and those tend to be longer-term arrangements, then you're going to show the interest expense in the operating section and the principal payments in the financing section. Those more shorter term type leases that will be operating leases, all of those payments are going to appear in the operating section of the cash flow statement. So we see in these three boxes on the balance sheet, right of use asset, lease liability. On the income statement for financing leases, we got interest expense and right of use amortization.
for an operating lease, we're just going to have a lease expense on a straight line basis. And then on, on the cash flow statement, we're going to have interest, interest expense in the operating section, the principal payments in the financing section, and then for operating leases, all of those payments show up in the operating section of the cash flow statement. You do want to make sure that your uh, operating lease uh, asset, that right of use asset, and the financing lease right of use asset, that those appear separately in the financial statements. The same is true for the lease liability. So you want to separately present the operating lease liability and the financing lease liability. Now you see a disclosure example here where we've separated the operating lease from the financing lease right of use assets. So this would uh, work under 842. You could also present this on the face of the balance sheet if you wanted to. I think most people will separate these out in the disclosures rather than on the face of the financial statement, but that will be up to the, to the entity that has the lease. And on this slide, as I said, your financing lease debt and your operating lease debt must also be shown separately, either on the statement or in the notes. And by the way, the current portion of principal should be included in your current liabilities. I'll take you back to where we started as we close this presentation. So when is an agreement uh, applicable under ASC 842 is when uh, there's an identified asset, there's a contract where there's an identified asset, the agreement conveys control to the leasee for a period of time and in exchange for consideration. And then we saw in terms of the presentation in the financial statements that right of use asset appears and the lease liability appears. Now, under ASC 840, the standard prior to 842, you had capital leases and we capitalized the lease debt for capital leases. And we also set up that asset in plant property and equipment. Going forward under 842, uh, that uh, capital lease will now be called a finance financing lease. You're going to have the lease liability, but you're going to move that, that plant property and equipment item down into the right of use asset. So you'll no longer show that in PP&E. With operating leases, we now set up a lease liability and a right of use asset. We never did that in the past, so that's completely new. So check out my other videos about leases. I think they'll help you get a better understanding of where this is going. Uh, I'm trying to make this simple. It can get kind of complicated, but I'm trying to do the heavy lifting for you and help you understand how to implement this standard. So until we meet again, take care. Bye now.